you know, like this fellow this morning, I ended up, you know, sending him the book, and he was excited to read it. And, um, I mean, he actually said he thinks diabetes is caused by soft drink consumption or the diabetes epidemic. So that's what led us into this. Um, and he just plotted soft drink availability versus diabetes diagnosis through the 20th century and said, oh, it's, you know, it's fructose. <laughs> um, so, uh, but for most the uh, hardcore molecular biologists, geneticists don't play that game. So, but those are the people, and I'm hoping that someday I'll get someone who cares. You know, I was uh, did a story for Discover Magazine on personalized cancer therapy. I have to just keep money coming in, and sometimes these stories, you know, they're interesting anyway. So I, I like writing about good science too. Um, and I was interviewing a fellow at Ohio State who runs, they have a big program now in collaboration with Lee Hood in Seattle on doing personal, personalized medical therapy. And um, as soon as he used the word overnutrition, I just got off the cancer story and started talking about the subject of this lecture. And by the end of the interview, I had sent him the URL for one of my lectures. And uh, within a week, he was on the Atkins diet and reading my book. And a week ago, I got, you know, an invitation. He wants me to come and give a talk at Ohio State and meet with their nutritionist. So, you know, will it make a difference? I don't don't know. But, I mean, I think it will. If the diet works with him and he stays on it, I'm in much better shape (laughs) than if it doesn't. Right, right. you know, I assume it worked for at least a month, or I wouldn't have gotten the invitation a month later after the interview. So, what about in your book? You talk about Dr. Neely, that guy who originally came up with like the thrifty gene uh, hypothesis. Have you yeah, spoken with yeah, him or yet? Yeah. Uh, he he uh, died around '99, I think, about oh. ten years ago. So I never got a chance to speak with him. No, um, no it's okay. Yeah. Hey, Gary, I don't I don't know if you. Uh, if you heard Tracy Green last week? Um, no. Tra- I heard she said that um, that I had talked, tried to talk her out of the group reading on the book. <laughs> no, no, but uh, she's you. You might not know this, but she's. Uh, it's very interesting that you're in California because uh, Tracy's the uh, state health officer in Nevada. Oh. Uh, okay. Tracy and I. This is Jim Greenwald. We uh, we serve on the. Uh, State Advisory Committee for uh, Fitness and Wellness, oh, and uh, like I said, it just before you started talking. Uh, oh, so that's there's some, right having an effect. There's there's some incredibly fertile ground, one state over from where you are now. How much longer are you going to be in California? Well, hopefully indefinitely. But <laughs> I also live about a half mile from the Hayward Fault, so which is due. <laughs> Well, um, we'll uh, Tracy and I'll get a hold of you. Yeah, no, I would love to. Actually, I'd love to. Come. You know, it's funny because when I lived where I lived in New York, one of the the people who lived in my building was um, Tom Friedman's chief uh, public relations man, Tom Frieden, the present head of CDC. You know, he used to be the New York City Health Department officer. Huh. And um, it's funny, of course, this guy is a former Newsweek reporter, and he's, you know, 5'9", 140 pounds, goes for 10-mile runs every day. I mean, he... But I got him to read my book, and I kept trying to get him to set up a lecture at, at the New York City Department of Health just to get this message across that, you know, posting calories on the menus might be the wrong approach. Maybe <laughs> I got absolutely nowhere with him, zero. I mean, I couldn't get close to that particular health officer. But it's nice to know that I'm having an effect on others. And, yeah, I, you know, I'd be more than happy to come lecture or talk to people if I think, um, you know, I'm having an effect. But with that, it's actually bath time here in California. <laughs> for the, uh, Thanks, Gary. Thank you, um, Gary. It's Jeff. I want to say thank you for your time. Everybody else, thank you for your conversation and discussion and questions. Okay, and one, um, you know, one thing, if you I'm want to contact me, you know, just, just ask Jeff for my email, and he'll, um, you know, he has my permission to, to pass it along. Hey, Gary, you said in your lecture to give you feedback about your analogy on the what makes the lecture room fill up, whether oh, that's right. a good analogy, and I would vote yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm a yes, too. Very effective. Sort of uh, evocative visual image, even. Okay.
Okay, thank you. Because my editor actually took it out of the relevant chapter in the new book <laughs> because he said, you made the point already. Just get on with it. Well, and I said, well, I might have made know, it to you, but you've been living with this for years. <laughs> so, yeah, um, and, uh, you know, talking about paradigm shifts, and that's fascinating to people, you know, I think who uh, who can think in those sort of terms. But as soon as you talk in analogies and metaphors, you get a whole other level of buy-in. From well, that's another audience. So that's just well, confusing, I think, for lots of people. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Let's hear a little bit more about the goal of IMS because you know it's one thing to start a website and have an organization but if you don't have a goal in mind it's really futile. Tell us what the goal of IMS is. That's a great question. I uh, Do you remember the old Animaniacs cartoon with Pinky and the Brain as the uh, um, little sub-characters on there? Maybe not, but Pinky and the Brain used to wake up every day and their objective was to, <laughs> no, you have no idea what I'm talking mm-hmm. about. Anyway, thinking the brain every day, their objective was to wake up and to change the world. And I feel kind of silly when I talk about that's what IMS hopes to do. But realistically, our long-term goal and our primary objective is to change the face of the way that we're doing healthcare as a country. And to do that by putting together best practices of medicine. And for many patients and many institutions, we understand that carbohydrate restriction is um, a good way to make a, a first effort at doing those things. We understand it to be preventative. We understand it to be effective. Um, we understand it to just make sense scientifically and medically. So before jumping all the way out and saying, we're going to change the world, we've backed up to build some more uh, measurable steps toward that, I guess. And so you've referenced the modules already, and that's the online educational component of what we're doing. Mary and Eric uh, put together a 14-week series that starts with kind of the intro level um, epidemics of obesity and builds through practical application types of things in relationship to how doctors can use carbohydrate restriction uh, modifying the behavior of patients, yeah. doing the clinical implementation of it, all those kinds of things. Then this summer we're building out a series of seven different modules that are taught by seven different docs from around the world, um, focusing on carbohydrate restriction as it impacts a variety of health fields. So, you know, Dr. Davis, who's the great cardiologist, and um, Jeff Bullock, who's researching uh, insulin and the metabolism at Connecticut, and just folks from all over the place who are doing various things. Our hope then would be that some of the folks who teach these modules this summer for us would then develop out of that and from that their own 6, 8, 10, 12-week module series. And so we would just continue to unfold and to unroll ongoing opportunities for education of physicians about carbohydrate restriction. Also then there's a a hope that we can get some of that connected in with medical school curriculum. Um, So many times doctors come out of med school and begin to learn these things and they go, oh my gosh, why didn't I learn that in medical school? Right. And so we're hoping that we can kind of penetrate that. We also then are opening and managing clinics uh, in hospitals and in physicians' offices using these practices. And one of the key pieces then of moving us to just a Um, impacting patient lives and impacting communities toward that hope of actually changing the way we do healthcare is a database that's been developed that doctors who use IMS protocols and who are interested in our work will all be a part of. And so this shared resource becomes what we're calling our universal knowledge repository. And I just think that sounds so exciting. Um, (laughs) Where we have doctors from around the country and the world putting in their data, folks who are using low carb and who are not, so that eventually we can begin running studies and analyzing, okay, everybody who's a 35-year-old male with a hemoglobin A1C above 12, um, what were the different things that different people did to treat those patients? What were the different outcomes that were received? And so our long-term goal would be that a doctor can have uh, a complex or a unique patient come before them, and they can then enter some of the different queries into the database and help them determine the best treatment protocol for that particular setting.